It's from Micah 6, 6 to 8. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Family, because we very much feel like Sutherland Seventh Day Adventist Church is part of our family. We feel like we're part of your family. Uh, my wife Leanne is right over here. If you could raise your hand, on. And I believe that the last Sabbath we were here was on the Sabbath that these two people over here, Matthew and Ryan, were married here in Sutherland. Uh, Matt, do you happen to remember that date? And what was the, yes, that's good. And, and does anybody remember what year that was? 2002 of December. So that was a long time. That was like 20 years ago. Uh, but we have always had a warm spot in our hearts. And I saw that Ryan today was here at the piano. So we have a, this is really a family reunion for us of sorts here to be able to gather with uh, Luke and Barbara. And uh, we're just glad to be here as part of the Sutherland Church family today. So uh, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Amen. Uh, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. And the reason I love coming to the house of the Lord is, is this is where the family of God is. This is where we gather. We gather here from week to week. We're here midweek service for prayer meeting. Uh, this is a place where I know that this congregation cares about this community with community services. Uh, your school here in the back lot, soon to be ready and soon to open again, just in a month or so. Um, this is the place where the light of Christ shines. And as I think about the family of God and what God has called us to be as a family, we're the people in the world that are called to love like Jesus loves. Amen? Amen? I mean, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing there's just too little of. Remember that old song? Some of you as old as me can remember that one. You know, what the world needs now, love, sweet love. It's the only thing there's too little of. And here we are, as God's people, the family of God, called to love like Jesus loves. And we start... With each other, we start loving each other. We actually, we start with our own homes, loving our own family. And from loving our own family and our church family and our neighbors. And then we begin to go out in wider and wider circles where we share the love of Christ. So that includes the neighborhood. It includes the places where we work. Um, we, my wife and I have lived in our house going on 28 years now. That is a long time to live in one place. Anybody else lived in your home that long? Yeah, a few of us. Well, what that means is, is that I get up and take a walk every morning, especially uh, back when I had my two dogs. We would go and we'd walk and we would just meet. Everybody wanted to meet our golden retriever and our Charlie. And uh, I got to meet all these people. And I realized the Lord was calling me. He said, you know what, George? I want you to be a, I want you to be a pastor. Be like a chaplain. Be someone who cares about the people of your neighborhood. Get to know them. Get to know their names. Uh, get to know their kids' names. Uh, just yesterday, I walked up to my neighbor's house a couple doors up. And went there knowing we wouldn't be there today because this afternoon they were going to have, have a graduation party for their son who's graduating from high school. And I think he graduated a couple weeks ago, but this was the gathering for the family. And I went up there with a card, you know, with, with some money in that card. And just go up there and knock on the door and said, hey, just wanted to congratulate Hayden. And his mom was just like, oh, thank you so much. Thank you for caring about our family. I mean, just this is the kind of way that you and I are called to live our lives. We live our lives knowing the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, which is our strength, no matter what's happening in our world. And as we look at our world, we just go, wow, it is just coming undone. It is just everything that can be shaken is being shaken. Was there ever a time that light needs to shine brightly more than it is right now? So we get to be those people. 
You and I get to be the people who are called to love like Jesus loves. Now, I'm going to tell you part of my story that the Lord laid on me. And uh, some people are going to go, oh, no. But here it goes. And I'm just going to start the story by telling you that I washed my hands very, very thoroughly before I came to church today. And I washed them when I was here at church as well. Now I'll tell you my story. I was walking along with my, you know, and my two dogs have died. And when I used to walk my two dogs, I always carried plastic bags because I didn't want to leave, uh, you know what, laying around the neighborhood, right? And so I'm walking along one day and I saw that somebody else had not had a pair, didn't have their bag along, I guess. And they, uh, and I thought, you know what, if my grandchildren were here, that would be Riker and Violet. And let's see, is Josie here? Josie and Louisa, Lucia? Lucia. And if Lulu and Jojo were here, I know my grandkids would be running around. They might actually like step. So I go, you know what? And all once the Lord said something to me, he said, your job is to pick up all the dog dookie in your neighborhood. I went, what? No. And the Holy Spirit said, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. And I said, oh, Lord, no. Are you serious? Yep. You get to be the guy that does that. Nobody else is. And so I walk around and I go, now that my two dogs have passed, I walk around still with plastic bags in my pocket. And whatever I see that someone forgot to pick up, then I get to pick up. And I thought, wow, Lord, really? You want me to do this? Yep, that's what I want you to do, remember? I want you to love like Jesus loves. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. That's your job. Okay, Lord, I'll do it. Well, we lived next door to a lady who, uh, and her husband who now has passed, but they were very, very clear with us. They would say things like, um, well, you know, you may believe, you can believe what you want to believe, but we're agnostic. We're just agnostic. We don't know. We, we don't know. We can't be sure what you can believe. But we're, and, so, and so we had this relationship. And it, over the years, uh, a number of times, my friend and I would talk. His name was Larry. And we'd talk down by the mailbox and have conversation together. And he would say things to me like, uh, well, you know, you know, my dog died. And after 28 years, you know, he had about probably four different dogs die maybe in those years. And we had two or three different dogs. Go, and he'd say, well, oh, you know, he says, that's what they're going to do with us someday. You just die and they throw you in a hole. And I'd say, well, Larry, I said, but, but if that story is true, which story is that? Well, the story about the man on a cross and he rose on the third day. He said, oh, you can believe what you want to believe. I'm an agnostic. I said, okay. Then he got sick several times. I go to the hospital and visit him. Do you ever go to the hospital to visit your neighbors? This is an opportunity. So I'd drive over and I'd go visit him and, and we'd talk a little bit. And then before I go, I'd say, so uh, Larry, before I go, um, would it be okay if I prayed with you? And he'd say, nah, you can pray in your own house. And I said, okay, I'll do that. I'll be praying for you. Well, I want you to know after 20 years, after 20 years of asking him that question, um, I visited him for the last time. I didn't know it was the last time, but I visited him. He was in a nursing home. And um, I said to him, I said, Larry, um, I'm getting ready to go on this trip. My wife and I are going to drive down. We want to go see the Grand Canyon. We'll be gone several weeks. And I said, before I go, would it be okay if I pray with you? And he looked at me and he said, you know, if anybody needs it, I think I do. After 20 years, after 20 years, he gave me permission to pray with him. And I pray with him. I pray God's blessing on he and his wife and his son. And, and I just gave him to the Lord. Um, when I came back, we came back from our trip. His wife came out and she said, Larry passed while you were gone. And uh, I got to tell you, I felt so grateful. And he asked for prayer. I believe I'm going to see him in heaven someday. You know, God knows. All I know is that man said, no, no, no. And at the end he said, yes. You know what? So see, we're called to love like Jesus loves in this world. By the way, his wife, his wife uh, saw me. And this would have been, oh, this has been a year ago at least. She saw me walking along by myself. And I had these, you know, I'm walking along and she sees me. She watches me and sees me walking along. She was on a walk also. We were passing the sidewalks. And she saw me stop and go and take out my plastic bag. And she said, what? You're picking up from somebody else's dog? And I said, well, Lord told me it was my job. And so it's so funny 
Now when she sees and, and we're walking, we're talking, and someone will come by, she'll say, this is my neighbor, his name's George. He picks up all the dog poop in the neighborhood. <laughs> now, I got to tell you, I think God is using that to get to her. Because she's done this more than once. So it's real. She's, she's like, this guy's doing this. And she knows I told her, the Lord told me that I was, this was my job. How God's going to reach her, I don't know. But I think that might be the entering wedge. Isn't that, don't we use that language? You know? So here we are called to be people who love like Jesus loves. And I am so thankful to be part of the family of God, the Seventh-day Adventist family of God. Proud to be part of this, that wherever there are people that need help, whether it's with hurricanes or fires or floods or earthquakes or famines or now like the war in Ukraine, wherever it is that God, the people, God's people, God's children need help, we're there to love like Jesus loves. Here in the United States, nationally, it's called Adventist Community Services. And I know you have a community services ministry here. Amen? And I know that there's another place internationally. And internationally, it's, we have a ministry called ADRA. A-D-R-A. Does anybody know what the D stands for? Development. That's right. Most of us forget that one. We know about the, the, the crises the earthquakes, the hurricanes, we know the, you know, the relief agency, but we forget about that development part. Um, I want to show you right now of just a very short video, and it's one from Myanmar, or Myanmar, however you want to pronounce that, but Myanmar used to be called Burma, and it shows some of the ways that ADRA, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, is in that country, by the way, which is a very closed country, but we're there. Um, thank God the door is open for us to be there to serve and love like Jesus loves. Let's just watch that video right now. Thirty-five years. It's certainly no small feat. Without Jesus, our God above, the work would not be complete. From the lush paddy fields of the south to the towering mountains of the north, Adra has reached across Myanmar, back and forth. Faces painted yellow with Tanaka, the place where hundreds of dialects can be seen. We work with all people, regardless of ethnicity, gender, race, or religion. Improving livelihoods and supporting education, we promote development in target communities. For those affected by disaster with mouths to feed, we provide relief to those in need. We are committed to creating change so all may live as God's foreseen. Our responsibility is to protect the vulnerable. Our purpose is to serve humanity. You saw those three, three words at the end, which is part of the Adra logo, which they took from Micah 6, verse 8. To do justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly with our God. And Adra has taken those three and kind of gone justice and compassion and love, that we would be those kind of people to love like that. Uh, I just recently heard a story that in the, on the island of Madagascar, they, they were Adra people there, and they noticed that the farmers were growing peanuts, and they bring the peanuts down to the local market, and they asked around, and they discovered that farmers would sell the peanuts, and they were earning about $250 U.S. a year. And that was enough to be kind of subsistence farming and kind of get through this. Well, one of the Adra, one of the young men, he said, you know what? I know a company in Switzerland that is 
processing peanuts and peanut butter. And they're looking and they're actually, their advertisement is, these are peanuts from land which has never been sprayed with any pesticide. And he checked and he said, oh, these farmers, it's never been sprayed, ever. In the history of the world, it's never been sprayed. And so he went back and he connected the people in Switzerland with the people, the farmers there in Madagascar and said, would it be possible? And, and the, the Swiss, Swiss people said, yes, they sent someone down. They worked out a contract. And these farmers now are shipping their peanuts to Switzerland, being made into peanut butter on land that has never been sprayed. And the farmers, which are making $250 a year, now make $2,500 a year and are able to send their kids to school. I mean, this is the kind of things that ADRA does, that you and I, our church, is looking to be a, a blessing to people in their lives around the world. Um, now, I recently had the privilege of meeting a woman who actually was in Portland, her name is Gabriella Astarte. She is an ADRA director for Romania. Her husband's church that he pastors is just 10 miles from the border with Ukraine. And she talked to me about what it was like in those early days after the invasion on February 24. And how the refugees were streaming across. There were lines of vehicles at the border 30 miles long. So ADRA called everybody together. All the ADRA people from Ukraine left. They were in the eastern part where the invasion came. They all left 30. They were at or had 30 people hired to work on water projects and medical clinics. They came across the border. Then Adra had just recently purchased about 10 different vans, these sprinter kind of vans, and they were loading them up as humanitarian convoys. To this day, they are still driving back and forth across the border, carrying food and helping the people to be able to come out of the country. Um, she told me, she said, in the first three weeks that they, in their church, and it, the pictures looked like it was no much, not much bigger than the Sutherland Adventist Church here, that in their church, that over 1,500 people had passed through sleeping in the hallways, sleeping on the floors, sleeping where they tried to set up beds for them downstairs, and eating together there in that place. And I want to just share with you a video here, just a very short video that shows the story of one family who came out across into Poland, that, that border, rather than Romania. And it's actually a pastor's family who came across, and we'll share this story right now from Ukraine. We didn't think that we were hungry or we couldn't take shower because there were no hot water. We just were thinking about, uh, are we going to stay alive today or are we going to die? And we were only praying all the time. And thanks God, we are still alive. Slana, I'm staying here in Poland at the church. Well, my family are refugees from Ukraine. My mom, my siblings, sister and brother. Unfortunately, our father, he's a preacher and he's left in Ukraine. When the first day of war started, we hoped it will end soon, but it didn't. And the worst part was that our city, Brzezansk, was occupied on the second and third days of war, so just from the start, and we couldn't leave the city at all. And the pharmacies, the food stores were completely empty. People couldn't buy food or even like simple medicines. And also we didn't have any network or we couldn't even call that we are alive. And our grandmother, she was so worried and we couldn't tell her that we are alive. It was so bad. Majority of us don't have relatives or friends here and the only people who help is church. The church gonna give us a chance to have future and help us with the basic things. And here's a bedroom, so we slept here and it's quite comfortable, it's warm here and nice. And we are really glad that church provided us a place to sleep. Jesus never asked, who are you? What is your nationality? Are you 
good person or bad person. He was open. And I think this is a good example for us. When we are helping others, it's like Jesus' hands will be through us. We change because of Jesus, of his impact on us. And we want to be his hands. We want to be his feet. Now the organization has people in and around Ukraine helping the hundreds of thousands of people flee. The groups here at home are getting involved as well. The Maryland A Group is going much farther, 5,000 miles farther, to provide direct help. It's already providing shelter to refugees in youth centers and church buildings. Agra volunteers cross the border themselves into Ukraine with this convoy carrying supplies. When they said, like, don't worry, you can feel like at home here and we will help you because we are your brothers and sisters in God. They just supported us and that meant so much. God's people said, "Amen, Amen." I mean, what a privilege to be able to uh, to be able to serve, and you and I have that privilege. I know that three brothers in uh, the Sunnyside Church in Portland, the Gramada brothers, uh, actually went to Romania. They were from Romania originally. In fact, that church, the ten miles from there, that was their village, their town, and they actually went there and ended up being drivers of the convoys into Ukraine. Um, and in fact, they're heading back like on July 20. And when you come to camp meeting on Friday night at seven o'clock, there's actually going to be a video that we have just shot, did a video shoot with the three brothers and myself. And this picture is going to be shared with our, our church family, with the whole Oregon, Oregon conference together of their story of serving. But we don't have to go that far, do we? We have people right next door to us. We have neighbors right here. And so God's just saying to us, look, love like Jesus loves. If it's your own family, if that's all you have to connect with, love like Jesus loves. Be there and be those people. Um, I retired on January 1 of this year, and my wife and I were saying, well, what's this going to be like? And we received this phone call, and it was Elder Ralph Watts, who uh, is actually, they call him the father of Adra, and he said, uh, George Gaynor, he said, I understand that you, uh, you're retiring. I said, I heard this from my son, and I had had a conversation with his son not long, or not much earlier than that, and uh, a few weeks earlier, and he said, I'm just calling to ask you a question. First of all, he said to me, he said, I want to call and ask you, he said, because you have the right name. I said, well, what do you mean I have the right name? And he said, well, it was your uncle Romy, Romy Gaynor, who flew with me in 1975 as we flew into Saigon to help bring as many of the workers of the Adventist Hospital out as we could out of Saigon in the last last three days. And he said, um, so I just have a question for you. Would you be willing to serve as Adra's ambassador to the Northwest? Just go and tell our story. He said, I'm not asking you to be a fundraiser. The Lord will touch hearts for people to give. He said, I want you just to go and you go and you be the ambassador for us. And I want your wife to be part of that too. And he said, would you two of you just go everywhere you can go and share the story? And we said, yes, we would. We would love to go and be part of telling the story of Adra because this is a way where we get to live out the love of Christ and get to share how the love of Christ is being shared uh, around the world in the name of Jesus. So here's the question of the morning. Because I've now shared the Adra story, but I'm going to ask a question now and dig just a little deeper. This loving like Jesus loves that we've seen here. Here's my question. Is this the gospel? Now, careful, it might be a trick question. Is this the gospel? I, it, it is definitely part of the gospel. Okay, I'm gonna make, let me argue this. I'm going to argue that what we have seen here is the fruit of the gospel. That the gospel itself is about what God has done for us in Christ. How does that work? So the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ is what God has done for us in Christ. 
And that what we see when we see acts of love and service, that that, be, that is the fruit of the gospel. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Ah, well, yes, but God so loved the world. Yes, okay, hold on. Let's go back to the Adra verse. The verse that Adra drew, it's inspiration for its own motto from. Let's go to Micah chapter 6, 6 through 8. Micah 6, 6 through 8. I'm reading this out of the ESV, and I think you're going to have it up on the screen here. What shall I come before the Lord with? And bow, my, bow myself before God on high. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings and calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Now comes this big one. Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Why do I say that's big? Because the people of Israel and Judah were beginning to do that. They were actually handing over their children as sacrifices to false gods, gods like Moloch and these abominations, as the Old Testament calls them. They were giving up the life of their own children in order to try to make themselves right with God. And God's looking at this and saying, whoa, 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 whoa. He said, whoa, I, I, he says, just hold on. I already saved you. I already saved you. When, when did you save us? I saved you when I brought you out of the land of Egypt and I opened the Red Sea and I brought you out and I brought you into Canaan across the Jordan. I saved you. He says, it's not what, so your salvation is not based on what you give me. It's what I, I give you. And you are now invited to give back to me in loving service. Amen. Are you with me here? Look what he says. Shall I give the firstborn of my transgression, for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? He told you what is good, O oh man. What does the Lord require of you? Do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. All of those are a response to the God who has already saved us. Amen? Amen. Now, what verse would you go to in Scripture? If someone said, give me one verse that describes the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, I'm with you there. And that, the first Corinthians 15 explains it. This is, he said, I want to remind you of the gospel, you know, by which you have been saved. And then he starts talking about, he was, he was crucified and then he was buried. And on the third day, he rose again. And that's the content of the gospel. Paul says, I want to be really clear with you what the gospel is. There's a verse all of us know and of all of us have learned, and you'll know it as soon as I say it. John 3.16. Let's repeat it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This captures the reality of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God loves the world so much. By the way, you know the two verses just before 316? The two verses in John, where he says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness... So the Son of Man must be lifted up in order that all believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. He, he, that is the introduction. It's the answer to Nicodemus' Nicodemus's question, how can I be born again? He'd ask it twice. How? How? And he goes, here's how. The Son of Man is going to be lifted up. He's going to take all the sin of the world on him. He's going to go into the grave. He's going to rise on that third day. And as he rises on that third day, you and I are now invited to unite with him in our baptism. Right here. Our baptism, anybody here in this sanctuary this morning baptized in this baptistry? Amen. Amen. Baptized right here. And what is, here I am, I'm 70 years old. And that means that I was baptized 61 years ago. 61 years ago, I was nine years old when I was baptized. I connect with my baptism every morning when I wake up. Unless there's a morning I forget. But I try to remember it every morning. I wake up in the morning. And before I get out of bed. While I'm still there just coming into consciousness. I just say Lord. Thank you for the privilege of waking up this morning. I know not everybody did. Thank you for this great privilege. And right here at the start of the day. Would you please unite me with Christ. Unite me with Jesus. So I could be buried with him in baptism. Raised up again to walk in newness of life. This is Romans 6 verses 2, 3, 1, 1, through, 3, 1 through 5. Raised up to walk in newness of life. 
life, newness of life, baptismal life, is life in the Spirit. It's to be died with Christ, die with Christ, and to be raised with Christ, to live as a new creation person, where the old is gone and the new has come in Christ. That's the invitation we're being given. God loved us so much, he gave his only begotten son that we could be united with him, and now we can rise up to be new creation people, where the old is gone, the new has come, and live out our baptism every day of our lives. I invite you to reconnect with your baptism. If you've never been baptized, if you've never been baptized and you know the Lord's calling you to do it, please talk to Pastor Gary. Pastor Gary and I had a nice conversation yesterday. Please, is it Gary Evans? Is that the pastor's name? And we had, we've never met. We're, we promised we'd meet at camp meeting. But we're looking forward to connect. But just connect with him and say, I want the Lord's laying on my heart for me to be baptized. Now, we've all memorized John 3.16. Has anybody here memorized 1 John 3.16? I propose that this would be a good, a good text to remember. Let's go to 1 John 3.16. Here it is. By this we know love. By the way, in the Greek, what do you think the love word is? Agape. Self-giving, self-sacrificing love. By this we know agape. He laid down his life for us. Now here it comes. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. We lay down our lives for the others. The gospel is what God has done for us in Jesus. That we might, if, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And that those who now believe in him, we're now called to live lives that are like Jesus as we lay down our lives for others. This is the fruit of the gospel, to love like Jesus loves. Amen? What a privilege. So let's nail this down really clear. It's really important. John 3.16 points us to the root of the gospel. 1 John 3.16 points us to the fruit of the gospel. The root of what God has done for us in Christ. The fruit is how we live out love in this world in Jesus' name. That's who we are in Christ. That we lay down our lives for others as he did. The root and the fruit. Get this. Root and fruit are always distinct. But never separate. Root, fruit, always distinct. But never separate. This is the loving response of our response to him. The Lord says to us, look, look, it's not what you give me. You know, shall I give the firstborn of my body for the sin of my soul? It's not what you're giving me that, you know, like, the, like the, pagan, the pagan people around the world who are looking some way to be right with God, they feel the sense of guilt and they would go and try to appease the angry gods by giving these sacrifices. He goes, it's, no, it's not what you give me. Cain, your best fruit, it's not what you give me. Interesting, you know, you say, well, some people say, well, what I'm going to give is, I'm going to do all my best. I'm going to give it my best. And if I work really hard, give me my best. And the Lord says, well, and then other people, oh, no, I'm not going to, no, it's, I'm going to be, I'm going to be committed to things like, like, like mercy and compassion and, and social justice. I'm going to get, and the Lord looks at all of these fruits from the left and the right and wherever we come from. And he looks, and he goes, those are all the fruit of Cain. It's not what you give me. That brings your salvation. It's what I give you, Cain. Here comes your brother Abel with a lamb. The lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's my gift to you. It's, in, it's crucial that we not confuse root and fruit. Always distinct, never separate. I invite you to take, I believe, a couple pictures of ours. A couple sheets were handed out to you. Everybody have a copy of this guy? This one here with the pictures? We'll move very quickly on this. As I see, we've reached the 12 o'clock hour, so I will not keep you long. But I want you to see this. Um, is it true that you go till like 1.30 here for your Sabbath service? Or, I thought I heard that somewhere. Maybe that was last week's church. Okay, okay, here we go. So notice on the side that has the picture with the tree and the Ten Commandments. And even with my 70-year-old eyes, I have good enough glasses to read this. It says, copyright 1876 by James White. 
And this picture, it, they spent, I don't know how many hundreds, if not thousands of dollars to get an artist to paint this as, this was, a high, this was like the high tech back in 1876. Is you come with this instead of being up on the screen and all the, all the, the uh, technology we have. This is high tech right here. So here they come and they wanted to give a picture of what it would look like. And they said, okay, here it is. And they made the statement, they said, okay, this is uh, the way of life, paradise lost, paradise restored. And they based, James White based this picture on the text, Revelation 14, verse 12, which we all know is something, is our identity, the text where we draw our identity from. Do we have that verse to put up on the screen, Revelation 14 and verse 12? Here it is. Here is the patience of the saints. By the way, the Bible I'm reading from the ESV, it says, here is the endurance of the saints. It's the same word, same Greek word. Patience or endurance of the saints. And they said, here are those that keep the commandments of God. And they said, this is what God's called us to be, God's people. We will keep the commandments of God and we'll keep the faith of Jesus. And it was preached to say it this way. If you will keep the commandments of God... And you can see the Ten Commandments here. You can see this, the picture of Cain and Abel, or Adam and Eve coming out of the garden. Cain and Abel, there is Abel lying dead on the ground. His own brother murdered him. You know, the, the book of what sin is. There's the altar of sacrifice and where the, where the forgiveness of sins. And you even see the man there putting his hands on the head of the lamb. All this pointing forward to the, to the shadow of the cross. But then you have the cross and the Ten Commandments then. All of this, they said, the Old Testament... Everything the Father commanded us to do, the New Testament, everything the Son commanded, if you'll do all those things and keep them, then up here in this upper hand corner, then you can go to heaven. How are you doing this morning? How are you measuring up? Woo! By the way, how many rules, how many laws did the rabbis find in the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch called the Torah? Anybody remember how many laws the rabbis discovered? 613. 613 laws. When, when Paul in Philippians 3 says, when I was a Pharisee, I was blameless, I kept them all. What he's saying is, I checked off 613 things. I did them all. I did all 613. Now here's this part of the story that most of us have never heard before. It's in Woodrow Whitten's book called Ellen White on Salvation. He just recently retired from Andrews University teaching at the seminary there. And Dr. Elder Woodrow Whitten found this piece in the White Estate in Ellen White writing. And she said, on his deathbed, James told me, Ellen, we gave them the wrong picture. Wow, that's huge. By the way, this picture, I do this and God owes me this. I do this and God will give me. That is the default position of the whole human race. Baptists, Buddhists, Agnostics and Adventists, whoever you are, that is the default. If I do this and I work this hard and I've got those grades, I deserve an A. Come on, teacher, hand it over. I work those hours and I put in my time, I get that paycheck. This is the default position of the human race. And James White, I praise God for this, on his deathbed, says to his wife, Ellen, we gave them the wrong picture. Flip the page over. I can read this down at the bottom. Copyright 1883, Mrs. E.G. White. James died. He passed away. Here's Ellen. And she is now putting this. And she goes and she spends the money to get a new picture painted. And it's a picture with Christ at the center. Christ on that cross as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Someone said to me, Pastor... What happened to the Ten Commandments? I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Do you see right there some lightning coming down on a mountain called Mount Sinai? The law, the, the law, the place isn't like, oh, the law doesn't matter. No, it's still there. God's standard still stands. What he's saying, though, is he's saying, look, 
He says, the new covenant says, I will write my law, where? On your mind and on your heart. God says, I'm going to write my law on your mind. You'll know my will. And on your heart, which is the organ of desire in the Bible, on your heart, you'll actually want to do what you ought to do. I have never been more free. I am never more free than when I want to do what I ought to do. And he says, that's the reality of the new covenant. I want to give you that reality where you actually want to do my will. I'm going to do that by pouring the Holy Spirit into you. And this man hanging on this tree, what did Jesus say? I always, he was under, they were charging him. It was in John 8 or where, he goes, look, don't you, no, I always do my father's will. This is a man who knew his father's will and did his father's will. I delight to do your will, oh my God. That's what we see. And if you want a verse, a verse that goes with this, I love this verse, and it was in the Sabbath school lesson this morning, brother, as you were teaching, it was that First Peter chapter 2, 24. But look at this verse. I love this passage of scripture, First Peter 2, 24. He himself, now I'm going to quote it from the ESV, which does the double emphasis, the he himself. It's like he himself. Let's see, I got to bang it. There it is. He, there's an exclamation. God, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. In order that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Here's our response to him. His gift, which is the good news of Jesus Christ, he bore our sins. And the death, there was no sin in it. Okay. I try to teach the kids at our church, you know, what's the gospel? I say, okay, here's the gospel. Christ took all the sin of the world on him, including yours and mine. But there was no sin in him. Death could not hold him. And on the third day, he rose victorious to the right hand of the Father. And from there, he's pouring out his Holy Spirit into our lives right now. That we might know his will and delight to do his will. I mean, there's the big picture. That's root and fruit held together, distinct, but never separate. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Just stop there. We should sing the hallelujah chorus right now. You know, all God's people shouted, hallelujah. Try again. All God's people shouted, hallelujah. Yes, he bore our sins in his body on the tree. Um, now, in response, we just go, thank you, Jesus. And as we say, thank you, Jesus, to him, we die to sin. Baptism is that picture. By the way, I always ask boys and girls, Riker, have I ever asked you, did I ever ask you this? When you're baptized, are you going to try to breathe underwater? Are you going to try to breathe underwater when you're baptized? No. No, you don't bat. No. I tell kids, boys and girls, don't try to breathe under there. It doesn't work. I've seen kids try it. Because why? Because baptism is this enacted parable of dying and we stop breathing. I've had one, I had one young man tell, he said, Pastor, I want you to put me under the water and hold me there till I squeeze your hand. I said, okay, I don't typically do that. And I put him down, and I held him there. And I thought, um, okay. And people started stirring. His mom almost stood up and looked, see what was going on. And finally he squeezed my hand, and I brought him up. He said, I wanted to make sure I was really dead with Christ before I got raised up again. So I said, okay, that's good. You, you got all of our attention. Um, so we die with him. We raise up to live with him, to be his people. Now, here's the beautiful part of this thing. The beautiful part of this is, is that when we come to this place, and by the way, this picture, on the first side, I wrote, keep slash do. Keep and do, then you'll be right with God. On this side, I wrote, receive and slash done. That's what God has done in Christ. And then I wrote, now come follow me and love like Jesus loves. So receive it. Receive it as a gift. It's been done in Christ. And now, united with him, I'm raised up where I follow him. And I love like Jesus loves, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Root and fruit. The privilege to live like that. And this verse... This verse that says, the last phrase says, by his stripes, you are healed. You are healed. You were healed. You are being healed. So we have been healed and God is in the process of healing. Substantial healing, no matter what it wrong. Okay. 
If we added up all of our years here, here we, we're well over a thousand years, right? Well over in this room. There's a lot of years that have been lived in this space right now. You think about all the sins, all the damage done to individual lives in this space. And what's the Lord saying? Here in this world, you say yes to me, you'll die with me, you're raised with me, I pour my spirit, I have healed you, and I am in the process of healing every part, every piece that's been broken, every piece that's been ruined and damaged, I'm, I'm healing you in Christ Jesus. You in me, in me you're 100%. I love this, and I love the way I read this somewhere, and this has really jumped out at me. This would be, if you want to have one takeaway today, it would be this one. If, our, if your religion is grace, grace being an undeserved gift, if our religion is grace, then the rest of our lives will be gratitude. Did you get that? If everything is gift... Every heartbeat, every breath I breathe, every, everything, I, it's all gift. If my religion is grace, then the rest of my life is gratitude. And I just go, praise God, I get to live this life. Thank you. Oh, you know everything about me and you still love me? What? Oh, you're an amazing God. You're an amazing God. Let's end with this. Grab, did you get that piece of paper that says Christ the way of life? Christ the way of life and this is from the book Steps to Christ. And notice here on this picture, the second picture, with Jesus on the cross, Sister White entitled this picture, Christ the Way of Life. As I read these verses, or these uh, several paragraphs in Steps to Christ, I'm entitling these, ver these paragraphs, Christ the Way of Life. I need to send this to the review because the whole church needs to hear this. These are the clearest words describing the gospel ever written by an Adventist pen. In the book Steps to Christ, way back um, 1891, 92 when it was published. Look what it says. The condition of eternal life is now just what it always has been. Just what it was in paradise before the fall of our first parents. Here comes the condition. Get ready. Perfect obedience to the law of God. Perfect righteousness. Whew. Right beside that in the margin, I've written 100% exclamation point. Wow. If eternal life were granted on any condition short of this, the happiness of the whole universe would be imperiled. If the Lord had, the Lord had come down and said to Cain, well, Cain, I know you got upset and you killed your brother, but oh well, we'll just let that go. What if he'd done that? Well, we'll just let that go. It, well, it doesn't matter. Isn't it interesting? When the Lord came to Cain, he said, Cain, what, what have you done? Well, my, my brother's keeper. I mean, Cain cops and added. If he would have dropped on his knees, God be merciful to me, a sinner, would the Lord have forgiven Cain right there? Absolutely. But then he would have said, I forgive you, Cain, but there's this other little issue. And that issue is that your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. So Cain, I forgive you, but I'm going to answer the cry of your brother's blood with my own blood in the person of my son. I'll answer it. I will take your consequence. He upholds the law even as he offers mercy and grace. What a good God. What an amazing God. He said the way would be open for sin if, if he just winked at it. The train of woe and misery would be immortalized. Okay, next paragraph. Catch these words. It was possible. It was possible for Adam before the fall to form a righteous character by obedience to God's law. But, here's the but, but he failed to do this because of his, his sin, our natures are fallen we cannot make ourselves righteous. Really? If I just grit my teeth and try harder? We cannot make ourselves righteous. Since we are sinful, unholy, we cannot perfectly obey the holy law. Boy, she is laying it out there. We have no righteousness of our own with which to meet the claims of God's law. Here comes the good one. But... Christ has made a way of escape for us. Amen? 
Amen. He lived on earth amid trials, temptations such as we have to meet. He lived a sinless life. He died for us. Now he offers to take our sins and give us his righteousness. If you give yourself to him, accept him as your savior, then sinful as your life may have been, for his sake you are accounted righteous. What's the word of that in the New Testament, the, the, the theological word? Justification. I love it. It works in English. Just as if I had never sinned. Ooh. You t- no wonder they call this stuff good news. Before God, I'm just as if I had never sinned. Just as if he had never sinned. His sake, for his sake, you're kind of righteous. Christ's character stands in place of your character. You are accepted before God. Here it is. Just as if you had never sinned. And I write there in my margin, justification. And then I draw a line under it and I write the word sanctification because this is the next paragraph. More than this. And by the way, Sister White in her own process, she wrote five chapters on Martin Luther in, in Great Controversy. Five chapters. Reading Daubigny's History of the Reformation, she reads this. She writes five chapters on this man. about he, He's the one who came in the champion of justification by faith. And then what, but she grew up in what kind of a home? A second blessing Methodist home. Holiness. And she, in her roots of that Methodist understanding, now brings in that peace and brings them together. Holds the Reformation together the way the denominations have not. The way we're invited as a denomination to do it. More than this, Christ changes the heart. He abides in your heart by faith. You are to maintain this connection with Christ by faith and a continuous surrender of your will to him. So long as you do this, he will work in you to will, here it goes, to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Isn't this amazing? God, the, God is at work through the spirit that he actually speaks to me at the level of the depth, the deepest level of my being at the level of the spirit where he goes and he whispers and he God works in me to, first of all, want to do the right thing, to will to do it, and then gives me the power of the Spirit to enable, empower me to actually do it, to will and to do his good pleasure. So, I, so, the, so you may say, the life which I now live in the flesh, yeah, that's us right here, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I've been crucified with Christ, Remember? Nevertheless, I live, yet not he, not I, but he lives in me. Jesus said to his disciples, it is not you that speak, the spirit of your father is speaking through you, in you. God is so connected with us that it, this is the part where now it's in, his, in our hearts. Then with Christ working in you, at the cross, he worked outside of us. Are you with me there? At the cross, he worked outside of us to pay the penalty of sin. He now, through the spirit, works in us to shape us to be people who love in this world, to be agape lovers. Christ working in you, you'll be able to manifest the same spirit, do the same good works, works of righteousness, obedience, to be a blessing in this world, starting with the people closest to us. So, final paragraph, we have nothing in ourselves of which to boast. Big zero. We have no ground for self-exaltation. I mean, if I was out here at at the beach, and um, what's the beach straight across? Is it Reedsport or Coos, wherever we go straight? If I was out there, I got caught in a riptide, and a lifeguard risks his life, dives in, comes out, and brings me back, and he drags me up on the beach, and and the crowd is gathered watching, and he brings me up, and I stand up and said, you guys see how I saved myself? What do you mean? I held on to the lifeguard. What are you talking about? He went out and grabbed you and dropped. You, you can't, no, that would be so foolish. I'm going I'm to boast about what he has done for me. It's craziness. Our only ground of hope is the righteousness of Christ imputed to us, counted to us as righteousness, 100%, and that wrought in us by his spirit, working in and through us, which Sister White called the work of a lifetime. Every single day. Every minute, every moment, saying yes to him. Not digging my heels in rebellion, but living my life to the praise of God's glory. Him shining his light through us, that we can be part of his light and his love in this world. Now, let's wrap it up with this. Matthew 24. We said it earlier. The world is coming undone. 
Our world is in big trouble. We're in crisis. And I look at these words from Jesus. Because lawlessness will abound. Lee and I, Lee and I live right, right up there, right on the edge of Portland, where we live in a place called Gresham. And we preached, uh, let's see, honey, we went to what, Healing Hope a couple weeks ago to preach. We drove past. Two days later, that intersection, a man was shot and gunned down right there. Five miles, less than five miles from our house. You know, we, we've heard and people around us say, we hear gunshots. Yeah, the lawlessness that's growing in our world. Why? Because the love of many has grown cold. The love there is the, is the agape word again. Self-giving, self-sacrificing love. How would you like to live on a planet where there is quantitatively, quantitatively less agape love? Less and less and less and less and less. Please vote me off that island, okay? Vote me off that island. But that's the world we live in. People say, well, the Spirit of God is being withdrawn. Why is the Spirit of God withdrawn? He's being kicked out. This is the sound of God being beaten with a stick away from us. And as God is beaten with a stick away from us, the world grows cold. But here's the word. The one who endures to the end will be saved. That same word, here's the endurance of the saints. How do we endure? Those who keep the commandments of God... In the faith of Jesus, the commandments, how do we keep the commandments of God? We keep the commandments of God. What does Romans say? You know, in order that the righteous, Romans 8, verse 4, the righteous requirement of the law will be fully met in us who live not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. To live not according to the flesh means I'm living out my baptism, death, resurrection. I die with him so I can live in the spirit. The way we endure in a time of lawlessness we keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, which is the gospel. And that gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a witness to all nations. Then the end will come. This is the time you and I are privileged to be living in. We're privileged to be living in the time of the end. Whereas the world turns its back on the source of love and life and light. That we get to be the people who love like Jesus loves. By the way, we're not the doomsdayers. We're the people of hope. I do not live as a doomsdayer. I am a man, and you can be a man or woman of hope. And we live, and we love like Jesus loves, and we love our neighbors, and we share the good hope and the good news of Jesus Christ. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. This is the gift he's promised. If your religion is grace, the rest of your life will be gratitude. Lord God, we thank you so much for this great privilege to be together in the name of Jesus, together as the family of God, here giving you our worship, our praise, honor, and glory. Lord, you are good. Your mercy endures forever. We are amazed at your mercy. We're amazed at your grace. Your grace giving us what we don't deserve. Your mercy protecting us from what we do deserve. And Lord, you've spoken a word of love over us. You have called us daughter. You've called us son. You've said we belong to you. And we cry out, yes, Jesus. We give ourselves to you, our lives to you. Please, Lord, pour your spirit into us. And indeed, may we have minds that comprehend and know your will, hearts that delight to do your will. And may we be part of your light, part of your love, to love like Jesus loves in this world. But your desire to be such a person, just lift your hand to the Lord right now and say, Jesus, please count me in today. I'm saying yes to you. Yes. I love you, Lord. Thank you. We give ourselves to you. May we go from here, Lord, to be part of your light in this community. May Jesus be lifted up and all drawn to him is our prayer. In the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. And all God's people shouted, hallelujah. God bless you all and happy Sabbath.